welcome the First United Methodist Church of Roseville, where we do our best to live into the gospel message of love as a community committed to offering hope to this world. Today also happens to be the day that God has made. And so we know that the most appropriate response is to what? And we're also rejoicing and being glad because it's the new year. And as I said before, we made it. <laughs> uh, to be honest, the last really two years have been kind of like this blur. However, as I saw the crystal ball drop in the middle of Times Square, because yeah. that's still kind of like my New Year's. <laughs> I've been out here in California for whew, almost 18 years. Um, I was just, you know, as I held with my family, just a wash with a sense of gratitude, a deep gratitude that despite all of the challenges, all of the starts and fits, all of the closing and then reopening and then fussing and then the COVID tests and all the other things and the like. We are still here. And that seems like such a simple statement and a simple sentence, but it speaks to so much. And so I am glad for that. So uh, I want to thank uh, Kathleen and Jan for holding it down last week. I was able to get some rest. On the 26th, I was going to go to New Orleans, but COVID had some um, say in the matter and decided to stay home. Um, and now, you know, this is the new year. Normally, this is the time where we talk about resolutions and setting new intentions of the sort. And, you know, we'll get to that, but probably next week. Because to that, technically, we are still in the Christmas season. Okay? And that doesn't change until after the epiphany. And so we're going to complete our Christmas reflections this morning. You'll hear more about what you might be seeing back there is the visitation of the Magi, or the three wise men, or the three kings. So we have a full day today with communion, um, and we'll start our worship experience. By the way, our music leader, John, is not with us today, so uh, he'll be back next week, but our prayers are with him in his family and in his absence uh, between Nancy and myself. We'll get through the songs together. <laughs> but we'll get through it. We'll get through it, just like we got through the previous year. So now I invite you to stand if you are able. Now call Mr. Captain Ford as we prepare for our call of worship. Oh, come, let us adore you, Christ the Lord. The star in the dark sky, the world is his coming. Led by the light of the star, the wise ones came to pay homage. We too come to the stable, seeking the man Arise, shine, the light has come. God's light of love is shining upon us.
Our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, and the work of Christmas by Howard Thurman. The coming of the Magi. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them when the Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, so that I too may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went and looked. The star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was born, where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary and his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and earth. Because they were warned, warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. The work of Christmas. When the song of the angel is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nation to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart by our servant. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, in these brief moments in which we share, I pray that you will open our hearts to receive that which you will have us to receive. And as always, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our heart always be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So, once again, I say Happy New Year. And I'm so glad that we made it. Christmas in the Evans family was great, filled with a lot of love and gift opening and our puppy buddy who's not pictured going through all of the <laughs> wrapping. It was a mess. Uh, they're not here today. They're taking Break, but they send their love. And as I said in the opening, technically, um, this is still the Christmas season. It doesn't end until the Epiphany, which is on the 6th. Next week will be the first Sunday after the Epiphany, and we'll continue to talk about the Epiphany going up until Lent. Um, however, today I kind of see it as a kind of transitionary Sunday, where we finish our reflections on Christmas to look forward to the Epiphany. Now to be clear, the upcoming Epiphany season is about celebrating God's manifestation or appearance as Christ Jesus to the Gentiles represented in the text by the Magi. Since we are not meeting again on Thursday, um, I figured we kind of explore elements of the Epiphany today, which in many traditions is called what? Three kings. What is it called? 
Little Christmas. That's a new information. <laughs> Little Christmas. I like that. Or Three Kings Day, some other traditions. Now, whenever I hear the story that I was just read, right, I get taken back to when I was a little kid. We didn't necessarily have a Christmas tree, but we had this plastic nativity scene inside the living room, very similar to this. It was large and it was a lot, but we enjoyed it. Um, you had Mary, you had Joseph, you had the shepherds, you had angels, you had sheep, you had the baby Jesus, and of course you had the three kings bearing gifts. And these were my absolute favorite characters because one of the kings was explicitly black, <laughs> and, and the other characters of the scene were nondescript or white. Um, but the green king, green king, he looked just like my uncle. <laughs> when you're young, notice these things. Representation matters. Historical inaccuracies aside, it's just it's something that I, I, I resonated as a kid. I love the story. And we are familiar with the visit of the wise men to the Holy Family who was living in Bethlehem, holding on to the tradition that there were three people mirroring the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And according to Matthew, these Gentile wise men, or magi, or seers, as the text really would say, seers, were guided to Bethlehem because they received a sign in the form of a star, a star signifying the appearance of a king. Needing clarification, when they arrive in Palestine, they go to the Jewish magistrate, Herod, hoping to get some guidance. Um, and they kind of put their heads together, discover that this new king will be born in Bethlehem. So off they went with these instructions to report back to Herod, so I can go, you know, worship him myself. They, of course, find the Holy Family. They are celebrated as the first people outside of the Jewish tradition to express adoration to Jesus, offering their gifts fit for royalty, oddly enough, not in some palace in downtown Jerusalem or some summer villa on the Mediterranean coast. No, just some nondescript home in the village of Bethlehem. Nothing special, nothing particularly remarkable. Important to note uh, that they received another sign to not report back to Herod and, you know, lead by another way. Precipitating uh, another story of extreme violence in the refugee narrative of the whole family. But let's go back to this text. Who were these people who showed up in this Matthew text as magi and kings and wise men? Well, some say they may have been Babylonian astrologers, others Indian sages. Some have said they might have been Jews, but they were from Yemen. Others hold that they were Zoroastrians from Persia and present-day Iran. Theories aside, the narrative provides unequivocally that they were visitors from the East, a group of foreigners traveling westward seeking to experience an encounter with the transcendent by way of a star. And in a way, it's easy to kind of skip to the arrival to this humble house of manifestation in Bethlehem. But what if there's some lessons revealed along the way of the travelers that are just as important? In fact, let's go back. Let's go back to Herod's palace. Now, putting aside the politics of the context, what we have is Jewish scribes and the foreign magi having to come together, or kind of sidebar, to figure out where to find Jesus. Maybe in this, this confab, right? Maybe they ate together. Maybe they exchanged all the pleasantries that one will find within that cultural practices of those regions. Imagine them kind of unrolling the scrolls and pulling out their stargazing tools and speaking through translators. And all the Matthew text sets up this incredible scenario. These people of difference somehow had to engage each other in order for there to be a revelation of the location of Christ. The Magi 
had the way because of the star, but not the where, this direction. And the scribes had the where, Bethlehem, but not the when. So this is a story from people from different cultures, different religions, different ethnicities, different races maybe, and different countries coming together despite their differences. It was only in their willingness to engage in that difference and their willingness to be changed by that engagement that they were able to find Christ. We say it in a different way. Christ was revealed at the intersection of engaging difference and at the willingness to be transformed by that encounter. So, what does this mean for us today? What if a new understanding of Christ being revealed in our lives is, is brought out at the engagement of those things that I have mentioned? Allow ourselves to engage difference, and allow ourselves to be changed by their comment. Now, on a personal level, what if this means that in this new year, not being afraid to challenge ourselves to engage people who are different than us, to humble ourselves, and be open to the fact that there might be someone who might be different than us, different race, different social class, different ideologically, different religiously, different politically, may have voted different than us even, right? That there's something that can happen in that interaction that can help us reveal Christ for us in a new way. What if as a church, we push back against the cultural instinct to turn inward, and insular, finding comfort in people with people who kind of look like us, and we committed, as we continue to do, in being a church dedicated to reaching out and engaging the perceived other, conceding and even expecting that we both can be changed in the encounter. Is it possible that Christ might be revealed in our church in a new way? And what about the larger church? What about our nation? January 6th is a day of epiphany, right? But it's also the anniversary of something else, something a lot less light-filled, being revealed at our nation's capital last year. But what if this year, in response to all of that, we were willing to take seriously that the revelation of Christ is dependent on our willingness to engage those who are different from us? No matter how hard enabling a new vision of justice and common good in this world at a time when people are tired, putting up with the persistently paralyzing pandemic that is perpetuated by a profusion of lies and the perverse plague of our polarizing politics. What if finding Christ is still possible? And what if we truly acted as if it were so? I imagine our lives will begin to mirror that of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. As many of you know, Archbishop Tutu died last Sunday at the age of 90. He was mourned by people from all across the globe. This Nobel Peace Prize winner and human rights activist was famous for his work as an uncompromising foe of South African apartheid. Beyond his country, he was viewed as a moral compass in all of the world affairs. Now, he started his career as a teacher before going into ministry because, as he said, it was a likely means of service. Eventually becoming the Archbishop of Cape Town, effectively becoming the spiritual head of all the Anglicans in that country. Now, this was not a small thing because he used his position of power to speak out against those in power who use their position for oppression. Speaking from a place of his deep faith convictions, Tutu once said, sometime before Mandela's release, he said, justice, goodness, love, and compassion must prevail. And prevail is what he did, speaking and ministering and writing books on topics like forgiveness and more. He truly embodied this idea of Christ being revealed at the intersection of engaging difference with his work on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 
interfaith and multicultural coalition building, but of course by his long-term and very close friendship with the Dalai Lama. There's incredible pictures of them being playful together. It's beautiful. And they wrote a book together a few years back called The Book of Joy. Now, though I know of this icon, Desmond Tutu, my appreciation grew for him because of a quote that deeply resonated with me. He says, God's dream is that you and I, and all of us, will realize that we are all family, that we are made for togetherness, for goodness, and for compassion. This idea of the dream of God that animated Tutu's prophetic imagination became an inspiration for a children's book, which became almost biblical in our young daughter's spiritual formation. God's dream was not only meaningful because the protagonist was a little black girl in overalls who kind of looked like my Niara at age four, but the message was clear as a star in an ancient Palestinian sky. The illustrator, the young fam, on every page animated the story of how our differences do not need to be obstacles, but how it takes some work to create a world that approximates the beloved community, where everyone is afforded their inherent divine dignity, expressing through the uniqueness of their particularities. One of the last pages of this book is where the children are kind of gathered together in a heart-shaped circle. In the words in the middle read, each of us carry a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. This is good. But the way we make this possible, I believe, is by engaging difference, like the Magi describes in Herod's court. Though we will not, though we will have directions to the house, our mission has just begun. For it is only then that the work of Christmas begins, as we heard of Howard Thurman, right? We get to the house and then we do the work. Howard Thurman said, when the songs of the angel is stilled, and the stars in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes and the magi are home, and when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nation, to bring peace among others, and to make music in the heart. You see, we are a long way from gifts of glowing gold and frankincense and bitter work, a long way from the mysterious magi and the Jewish scribe meeting together in Herod's court 2,000 years ago. But I believe that we can experience Christ together if we are willing to engage those who are different than ourselves and willing to be changed by it. And if so, then we can get to the work of Christmas that we just talked about, creating a place of justice and joy for all people. And as a people, we can shine like the star, like Tutu's vision of God's dream. O lovely eastern star, that tells us of God's morning, heaven's wondrous light, oh, never cease thy shining. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare now for the communion. Let us begin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our hands. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God. Like those ancient magi, we too have come asking for the child, wondering where we might find the place where the love is born. We've come seeking the joy that satisfies our soul's thirst. We have come, even though we have wandered through the darkness of so many mistakes. We have come, star-following, to the place where the Magi were directed to by the light of a bright and distant star. We have come to the place where the shepherds huddled the young family and child. We've come to this place called Bethlehem, to the 
place where our hearts rise like yeast, the place of our newborn hope, the place where Jesus was born. In Bethlehem, we take note of the name. Bethlehem, Bethlehem meaning bread, Bethel meaning house. In our arrival, we know that there is something at this table that will satisfy our hunger. No matter how long we have wandered, here our hearts rise. Our light has come. In this bread and cup, we remember the story. Remember that God has made a house for all people at this table. And remember that it is God who satisfies our deepest hungers and thirsts, often from the most unlikely of places. At this time, we also remember another night. The night in which Jesus, now some 33 years removed from his birth in Bethlehem, was about to be betrayed. And at a meal with his friends, he went and he took the bread. And as was the custom, he gave thanks. And then in their presence, he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, after the talk had died down, he then picked up the cup. Likewise, he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood and the life of the new covenant, poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the life and body of Christ, that we may also be for the world the life and body of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with you, one with each other, and one in the ministry to the world. That on this Sunday before the Epiphany, we might be the light that you have called us to be. Pray this now in your holy name. We all say, Amen. Amen.
as we have come and sup at this table, we speak a word of thanksgiving for your invitation to all people to live a life committed to love, liberation, justice, and joy. Being so nourished in our body and our soul, may we be strengthened in our gospel-led living so that we might be for the world vessels of grace, of hope, of light, and love. Amen. Thank you. 